say. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice For how great is our God Just sing with me How great is our God And all will see how great How great is our God It's too late As 
because I meant your holy name. For you are great, you do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. For there is no one else like you. For you are great, you do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. For there. Set my feet 
Because God always moves in the supernatural. He always moves in the miraculous. And some synonyms, I, I added this word up there so we would sort of know this. Some synonyms for the word amazing are excellent, wonderful, awesome, incredible, stunning, marvelous, fascinating. Again, these words truly do describe God. He's that and a whole bag of chips, a whole lot more. You know, um, he, 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 is, he is an awesome, awesome God. But what does the Bible say about our amazing God? We've used this portion of scripture each and every week, and I'll end a little bit with more of this scripture at the end of the, of the message today. But in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 through 26, it says, To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. And I just want to stop there a second before I read on. God is literally talking to Israel through Isaiah. And I believe he's even asking us today, who can we compare him to? Who in this world? Think, I want you to really think about it now. What in this world, who in this world can you compare to God and who is his equal? See, if we're able to make some comparisons and all of a sudden we really don't know who God is. We really do not understand how awesome he is, how amazing he is, because he has no equal. Because he says there again, says, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. The whole universe is held in place by him and by his word. And it's all because of his great power and incomparable strength. When we dove into this two weeks ago, the first week, we discovered that an amazing God in his act of creation. When we read, then God said so and so, and that's what happened. From a human standpoint, we need to understand that is truly, honestly, mind-blowing. It's like... Uh, you know, Brandon helped me out that week. I tried to help him create a man. But I should have had him probably also say, Brandon, come up and say, let there be light. Now, I could have messed with him. I had some kind of light switch I have going on and off. And we could have him sort of act and do that. But just sort of speak and speak things into existence. He spoke land. I mean, think about it. God spoke land into existence. He spoke water into existence. Spoke air. Everything. All the elements. Everything. He just literally spoke them into existence. And like I said, and this is amazing. In Psalms 33, verses nine, 6 through 9, we read this. The Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word, and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord. Let everyone stand in all of him. Let everyone stand in all of him. For when he spoke, when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. Again, he is an awesome, awesome God. Then last week, we dove into and discovered the amazing way that God delivered Israel from Egypt and made them into their own nation, showing that he alone is God. And these were some of the verses that we ended the, the, the message with last week. In Deuteronomy, verse 4, verse 30, 35, it says, He showed you these things so you would know that the Lord is God and there is no other. God does certain things so we can know, so we can have assurances that He is God. Can we scientifically prove there's a God? To some degree, no, and to some degree, yes. I, you'll have to look at some of the videos that we have out I'll have to sort of make them available on my, on my Facebook page from what we've been doing on, on our Bible study. Where, again, we, there's some guys that are a whole lot smarter than me, and they can begin to explain it to you. And how literally that, uh, because of different things that science are saying now, it's, it's truly pointing to the fact that, that, they're, that they can almost sort of, with scientific reasoning, prove that there is a God. I mean, it's, it, it, it's some neat things. <laughs> again, so Psalms 86.10 says... For you are great and perform wonderful deeds. You alone are God. Isaiah 46, 9 says, Remember the things I have done in the past. For I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. God, he is God alone. There are no other gods. He alone is God. 
So that's what we dealt with over the first two weeks. Now this week, we're going to discover the amazing way that God continued to deliver Israel. And he showed that he is the way maker. Now I could, I could use this way maker thing for several of the messages going through, but I'm using it for today. I could use it for the one I'm going to be speaking in two weeks. I'm going to remind you guys again, remember next week we will not be here. We will have a, we have a, two guest speakers here with us. Don and, Don, and, Don and Darlene will be here for us next week leading in worship and speaking and everything else. So again, I'm going to encourage you to come out and be a part of that. Um, but the week after that, I already, I already know where I'm going with this thing. God's already opened that up to me and I, I'm looking forward to what God's going to do there. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm telling you, he is an awesome God. Again, when, 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 I, when, I, when I'm studying this material, when I'm studying his scriptures and word, and I read this, I'm telling you, God is awesome. He is awesome. So, this week we're going to discover God's amazing way to, to continue to deliver Israel and show that he is the way maker. And we're going to be talking about probably one of the best known stories that, that even people in the world have heard of. Because that they see it in the movies, that they see different people play around with stuff with this in the movies. It's the crossing of the, anybody want to know? The Red Sea. Almost every single one of us have probably heard of the story of the crossing of the Red Sea. Whether or not you've heard it from a biblical point of view or just seen it from Hollywood, whether you've seen the Ten Commandments, when Charles and Hesse's out there going, you know, and all this stuff. And, and later on, I'm going to show you a clip that's going to sort of be on this, but it's going to be a little more on the humorous side, which I think you will enjoy, but okay, I, yeah, we'll get there. Um, but we're going to be talking about the crossing of the Red Sea. See, after Israel left Egypt, and they were on their way out, Pharaoh had a change of heart. And he changed my mind. Remember last week we talked about the very last plague that hit Israel, I mean, hit Egypt, was the death of the firstborn child. When the death angel came through, and then that night anybody that did not have the blood of the lamb smeared on both sides of the door or above the door, the firstborn in that household, whether it was a, a human or, or, a, or, a, or an animal, died. The male child, the first male, the firstborn male child, died. So Pharaoh had lost. All, all these people had losses, and, and they were, and, they, and then it so hit them that they literally, Pharaoh literally kicked Israel out of Egypt. Literally forced them to go. And in fact, God allowed the the, the terror of Israel to so fall upon the Egyptians that when Israel asked fellow Egyptians, "Hey," Can we have this? Can we have that? Literally, the Egyptians gave them whatever they wanted. And the Bible says that they plundered Egypt as they left. In other words, like an army going in and conquering them, except they didn't have to do any battle. God did the battle. God did the miracles. God allowed the plagues to happen. And Israel was able to collect the plunder because what these people were doing, they were trying to heap favor upon Israel so God would have favor upon them. See, which means that should be a little bit of principle to understand to you. If you're truly following the Lord and you're truly seeking his face and people are seeking the favor of God upon you, they're going to bless you. Why? Because they want the blessing of God upon them also. But they really need to see God's favor upon you. And the way we do that today is by truly what? Living faithfully, believing what his word says and going after him and believe and just living that life that is pleasing to him. So literally they plundered Egypt as they were leaving. In fact, uh, in, the ver in the chapter we're going to read today, I'm not going to start at the beginning of this chapter. I'm going to start a little bit farther down in it. It tells us that when Israel left in slavery, they, they literally left with their fists raised in defiance. Elder was saying, yeah, we're out of here. Yeah, you know. It, 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 they did it in a very defiant way against Pharaoh. But as we get ready to dive into what we're going to look at today, after Israel left, Pharaoh changed his mind and then he pursues them. He gathers his entire army, chariots and everything, and he pursues the children of Israel. See, but here's the thing. I'm not going to read this part here this morning, but I'm just going to tell you about it. God planned all of this. He says, Moses, I want you to take the children of Israel in this direction because when you do, Pharaoh is going to think that you guys are lost. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to move upon him again. He's going to think, he's going to go to himself. What, what are we doing letting our slaves go? We need to go get them. So he musters his whole army. He says, and they trap themselves by the sea and between us. He says, and we'll recapture them there. He's, but, but he's like Moses. He said, but this is my plan because you won't see these people anymore. I'm going to deliver you from them. So go camp 
by the God already gave Moses the way. And you need to understand, God already gave Moses the way of how he was going to do things. So when I, when I talk about something a little later on, you understand where God is simply telling Moses, just basically, just do what I told you to do. All right? So we're going to, uh, to pick up here. Believing that they were trapped between Pharaoh's army and the sea, Israel cries out for help. All of a sudden now, Israel, they left in defiance. That they're getting to the place that they're now, they now have the, 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 the Red Sea in front of them. And they see Pharaoh's army approaching them. And they become scared. And this is what we read in the word this morning. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 12, it says, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking others. They, they, they were quickly approaching where they were. They cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Now, again, Moses and Aaron are one and they're two people. And later on, I'm going to read a number to you of how many of them there were. Because I said we'd come back to that. But these two people made them. Reminds me of a story that Bill Cosby once told in one of his, uh, Bill Cosby himself. He says, No, -uh, Mom, we wanted eggs and toast and juice, but Dad made us eat this chocolate cake. Moses made Israel leave Egypt. Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than corpses in the wilderness. Now, to some degree, I understand the last portion because they see the army approaching. But they're saying, like, Moses, we told you this was going to happen. We told you, we told you, we told you. Yet these are the same ones that the Bible tells us that they left with their fists raised in defiance. They're pretty fickle, aren't they? How many people think they're fickle? And how many don't know we're fickle? All right, so, so we know when we say this, we're speaking to ourselves too, you know? You know, many times when all of a sudden something happens, we start saying, God, why? Why did you make me? No. You, you, you chose. And they followed Moses. But they, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were uh, upset that they, they were scared, that they were nervous because they see the Egyptian army coming toward them. Then verses 13 through 18, it says, But Moses told the people, Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never, you will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Now just think about it. Moses tell them to stay still and be calm. And God has said, why are you calling out to me? Get the people moving. See, again, remember I told you, he already told Moses before what he was going to do. And I think Moses, because everything's going on, sort of forgot. And he, he knew that God had it in control. Because why? He told us, just watch the salvation of the Lord. But, but, but also, God is simply saying in this, and through this whole parable, and through this whole story, this account, we need to understand it's not a parable, it's an account. It's a, it's a real life account. He's saying that sometimes we need, to, we need to keep on walking in what? In faith, we need to keep on moving forward, even though things may look like it's all crazy around us. It may look like we, we don't have anywhere we're going. We just need to keep on going in the direction that God is telling us yes. to go. Yes. We need to keep on going in the direction that God is telling us to go. Because He says, Tell the people to get moving. Why are you crying out for help? Just keep on going the way I was telling you to go. He says, Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians 
and they will charge in after the Israelites. My great glory will be displayed through, through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. And when my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am the Lord. So again, he's reminding Moses of his plan. He says, you just part the sea. He says, I'm going to take care of us, and I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But, but listen, see, they're rapidly approaching, but listen to what God does. And again, you would think, you would think when this begins to happen, you would think the Egyptians, all of a sudden, a light bulb would start going off on their head. And they say, uh, maybe we should hit the brakes here, but, but, but listen. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all night turning the seabed into dry land so the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea in dry ground and waters a wall on each side of them. Oh, wait a second. I got ahead of myself. Oh. Sorry. Verses 19 and 20. I jumped ahead of myself. Then the angel of the Lord, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved to the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptians and the Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and the Israelites did not approach each other all night. Literally, where the Egyptians were, it became as darkness to them. Where the Israelites were, the cloud gave light to them. And you begin to figure that also where they can see the Egyptians, this cloud moves and you can't see them anywhere. You begin to say, um, something's happening here. What just happened over the last several weeks where we were living? There were these things that happened that all this different stuff happened to our, our nation. We lost our cattle. Uh, we lost our firstborn. And we were dealing with lice, frogs, locusts, um, darkness, um, all this stuff. But yet, it didn't. It just kept on trying to find their way to Israel. But Israel had light on their side. And then again, verses 20 and 21 and 22. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through, through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all night, turning the seabed into dry land, so the people of Israel walked across the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Again, when the Bible says that they walked upon dry ground, I believe they walked upon dry ground. Because a lot, if you read a lot of different things, people try to, if you just Google the crossing of the Red Sea, they'll say, well, it looks like it might have been here. So, you know, some of, them, some of them try to say, well, you know, where Israel crossed, the water might have been like four or five inches deep or maybe a foot or two foot. Uh, even then, yeah. the thing about that's even a greater miracle that God drowned the, the Egyptian chariot riders in, in a foot or, or a couple inches of water. So, so any way you look at it, it's, it's, it's a miracle. But, you know, they try to say what well, was muddy and all that stuff. The Bible plainly says, I don't care what translation you look at, it says they walked upon dry ground. If it was muddy, they would have said muddy. muddy. Yes. But they walked upon dry ground. Somehow, in some way, God was able to do this and make this, make this the bottom of the, of, the, of the seabed dry to where they could go across. But I need a volunteer this morning. I need somebody to help me out here with something. Huh? All right. All right, we're talking about the crossing of the Red Sea. Sorry, you guys, the camera won't be able to see this. All right. We have our own little sea here. Here's your rod, Moses. All right. God said, raise, your, raise the rod over it. Speak to it. And say, part, now at this part, I want you to be God, and I want, I want the strong wind to come and give me a path across the sea. God, part. I got this much of anything. Come on, come on, let's see. Come on. Can I get a straw? I, I wish I would have thought about that. We gave you a straw. I can't blow any more. That's okay. <laughs> but again, I get, and again, you know, I had just a little baking tray here. And, and Melissa, when she blew, she could get a little bit of a. I mean, I could, I could blow it a little bit, but I can't. 
Sustain it. God, God literally, this wind blew all night long and separated the water. It may have looked a little bit, like I said, I'm going to show you something a little bit humorous here this morning. Okay? And this will, what the clip I'm going to show you will tie in a lot of the messages that we've been talking about. Okay, this movie clip is from a movie called Bruce Almighty. Anybody ever seen it? Bruce Almighty. All right? Remember, when I talked about in the very first message that when God spoke, it happened, you'll see a little bit of something like that, but you're also going to see the party. So I hope you enjoy this little bit of humor singing, and then we'll dive back into the seriousness and the awesomeness of all this. Dave, go ahead. Do me a favor. I thought it was a little bit of a humorous way to look at the parting of the Red Sea, the tomato, the tomato soup, you know, red. Uh, and then God shows up and says, you having fun? <laughs> but, you know, when, when I, I was, I was looking for a clip for it, and I, I know I could have pulled out old Hollywood stuff, but I figured let me pull out something that's a little bit more fun, a little bit more comical. But even, even in that comedy, you saw some biblical truths take place. If you know anything at all about that movie, Bruce is literally Morgan Freeman playing God. He takes on the form of Morgan Freeman. And he says, okay, if you think you do a better job, here you go. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my God powers. Hence why when, when he said, excuse me, I need a... Oh, he's, what he need? When it, what, whatever God speaks... Also, he let there be light, and there was light, da, 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 whatever got, it will happen. Again, I could have took you back earlier. We could have pulled up the film when he's, this stuff, and you could have seen where just, he was talking about something, he said something about Clint Eastwood, and all of a sudden now he's starting to look and act like Clint Eastwood, and he, he had the call, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we watch it, and we see it, you, know, that, that's, you know, that's, it's a funny clip. But, but I don't know if you realize really even how biblically they even stayed with it. Because when he went to park the water, also what began to happen? The wind blew like crazy. It blew the door open. Everything, everything in the diner is going all over the place. 
But God truly did perform a great miracle that day. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 30 through 31, it says, And this is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. The Israelites saw the body of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore, and when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. And they put their faith in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. There are times that we may have to walk through some hard places. But God will display his power and he will declare, he will show that he is the way maker. We may seem like our back is against the wall, but he, and I'm going to say this even a little later on, he will make a way where there seems to be no yes. way. Well, we have to put our faith and trust in him, and we have to have faith in him, and we have to continue to place one foot in front of the other. I want you to understand how great this miracle actually is. I said last week that we would come back to the number of Israelites that left Egypt. According to a census that was taken, there were 603,550 3, fighting men. That's according to Numbers chapter 1, verse 46. Based on this figure, scholars have estimated that the total number of Israelites would have been between 2 to 3 million people plus their livestock. Now, now, now listen to me a second. A lot of times when you see this stuff, you saw the little path that Bruce Almighty opened up. You, a lot of times you see the things that Hollywood does and how they do this thing. But I want you, I want you to listen to this actual statistic. If the Israelites had crossed the Red Sea in double file, in other words, side by side, two people at a time, listen to this, the column would have been 800 miles long, and it would have taken about 35 days and nights to cross. Other words, when you see the little path that sometimes they show, it would have taken them way too long. And the Bible says that this happened overnight that this happened over night and the column may have been as wide as 5,000 people wide or almost as wide as three miles as they cross the sea three miles wide and I'm going to talk to you about some other numbers in, in the upcoming message and again it will truly show you Honestly, how awesome God is. And when you, when, you, when you think of this, that God created a path at, at least three miles wide. That, that's over 15,000 feet wide. Three miles. That's a long distance. That, that would be if you were to leave here and go out to Mountain Road and turn and head towards Ritchie Highway. It's probably pretty close to that distance. Three miles. And it allowed them to cross the Red Sea in a matter of hours. Two to three million people. And I have to say, can you just say, wow, that is amazing. It's mind-blowing. But that's our God. Did you hear me? But that's our God. He always works in the amazing. He always works in the supernatural. He always works in the miraculous. Why? Because that is who he is. Everything he does is amazing and miraculous. But here's the thing. Just as God did for Israel, he'll do for you. When it seems like you're trapped on all sides, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. We just have to do as, as God told Moses, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Just step on in faith. Just do what I, see God already gave Moses the game plan. And he basically, Moses, just do what I told you to do. Keep moving. Keep going in the direction I told you to go. And as he did, and as he followed the Lord's game plan, the miraculous happened. And they were delivered from their enemy that day. So I'm going to close with this thought here. 
again, talking about this, seeing that he truly is the way maker. He, he desires to be the way maker in our lives. How can we apply this to, to us? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like I said, I'm going I'm to read the verses that we first open our message with in Isaiah, but I'm going to go a little bit further into them. When we look at what God is saying through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verses 25 through 31 says, To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asks the Holy One. Who can we compare to him? And I, I, I talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the message. Who can we compare to him? Who can we say that is his equal? He says, look up to the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Old Jacob, how can you say the Lord doesn't see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? See, many times in our own life, we may say, well, God, you, are you even seeing what I'm going through? And first off, do, do you under, I know sometimes we feel that way, but do you really understand, and I'm going to use this word purposefully, how stupid of a question that is? And again, it's fine to ask it, but I'm saying, but, but sometimes I think we, we again, we, we give God human traits and human qualities, and what, what, let me say, human limitations. Let me put it that way. We give God human limitations, like he's not aware of things. Remember, he's the one that, that Peter wrote that, that you know, 5,000 years after all of this transpired, Peter wrote that Jesus Christ was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Peter was making it known that, you know, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it didn't take God by surprise God wasn't scratching his head up in heaven, scrambling around trying to figure out what to do. Before the world was even created, Peter writes, before the foundations of this world, the way of salvation has already been put in place. God already knew man was going to fall. God already knew man was going to mess up. And he was already had in place a way of salvation. It was going to be Jesus Christ coming to the sun, coming down in the form of a human being, in the person of Jesus Christ, living the life that he did, walking the road of Calvary, dying the death that he did, but also raising three days later to give us hope of everlasting life, that, that once and for all, God has defeated Satan and sin once and for all through this one named Jesus Christ. We need to understand God knows what's happening. Sometimes we may feel like that maybe he doesn't see. But he does see. He sees all things. He knows all things. And I know sometimes we feel frustrated and we ask these questions. But, but, but God says, this, oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say the Lord ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. Understand this, God never sleeps. Why? Because he doesn't have to. He doesn't need to. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. He never gets weak. Nothing can weaken who he is. Satan could come against God with every single power he can muster, and, and, and God could just go, boop, and it's over. That would be the battle. And actually, God wouldn't even have to go, boop. He could just say, stop, and that's it. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. And with that, you need to say, Amen. Thank you, Lord. Because how many of y'all know we're weak without him? We're powerless without him. But he gives us strength. He gives us strength. Even youths become weak and tired. And young men will fall in exhaustion. But I love verse 31. I love verse 31. And this is the end of this chapter here. But those who trust in the Lord will find 
new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Because understand this, it's not you who is doing it, but it is him who is living in you and working through you. All you have done, as this verse says, those who trust in the Lord. Many of you probably know it from the King James. And in the King James, the King James says this about verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord. The New Living Translation says those that trust in the Lord. But they that wait upon the Lord. Wait means to bind together, perhaps by twisting. That is, to, to collect figuratively, to, to expect, to, to gather together, to look patiently, tarry, wait. Wait, wait for, wait on, wait upon. But you know, when, when I read this definition here, where it says it means to bind together, perhaps by twisting, the type of visualization that comes to my mind is someone sort of grabbing hold and never letting go. It brings to my mind how, well, especially, you know, as a parent, as a grandparent, when, when you see your children will all of a sudden come up have you ever had them just grab a hold of your leg and just hold on, especially if they, if, they, if they knew you were going somewhere or whatever, and they just grab a hold and don't let go. I'm not going, you're not going anywhere without me. You're not going anywhere without me. Do you realize that's sort of the visual picture that God wants us to have of him? Of us just literally just going up and just wrapping ourselves around him and say, you're not going anywhere without me. You're not, I'm, I'm holding on. You're not, you're not going anywhere without me. That's the type of relationship that he offers us. And that's what the Bible says that he is offering us. Oh, what a promise. What an amazing promise from our God. That he says that those who trust in him, that those who wait upon him, those who grab a hold of him, will find new strength. Will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And it's all because of our amazing God. God is amazing. He made a way for Israel through the Red Sea. And again, I know we show these little things up here and they're funny to watch in the video clips. But truly just stand in awe and wonder of what he did and what he's done. And the thing is, what he did for them, he will do for you. How do I know this? Because God never changes. If he was faithful to them, guess what? He will be faithful to you because that is who he is. Our God is a way maker when there seems to be no way. I'm going to start musicians up. But I wanted to encourage you with this portion of scripture as we close out today and help you understand that it's for those, it's for those who trust in the Lord. He is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. I don't know if maybe you, you may be going through some struggles or whatever right now, but I'm here to tell you that there is nothing too difficult for our God. There is nothing that is impossible for him. But as this verse 31 of Isaiah 40 tells us, we must get to a place where what? Where we trust in the Lord, where we wait on the Lord again. That wait in the scripture here, it doesn't mean just to sit there. It literally means to literally bind yourself to, to twist yourself around, to grab a hold of. And when you do that, then you can have the promise of what Father said in that verse. But one thing I do know, he is the way maker. And if you've been struggling or if you just need a fresh touch from the Lord, I'm here to tell you,
He's here to encourage you. See, because Israel was, was down and depressed and upset when they saw the Egyptian army coming. And God said, just keep on walking in faith. Just keep on walking in faith. And they walked across the Red Sea. Think about this. They walked upon the Red Sea. But the thing is, until the Egyptians died, they didn't place their trust in him. I mean, hey, I'd be, first off, you saw the ten plagues, everything that happened there. You were allowed to leave in defiance and you plundered Egypt. You're walking across the sea with walls of water up upon dry ground that used to be muddy and wet. And yet the faith doesn't come in till the water crashes back down upon the Egyptian and kills them. They see the bodies on the seashore. And you folks say, what's it going to take? But many times, think about this. We are the same way. We see God move time and time again in our lives. And yet we truly don't trust Him the way that we should. And I'm here again, I'm here to remind you that He is an amazing God. He is an awesome God. He's worthy of our trust. He's worthy of our love. He's worthy of our adoration because He is awesome. And I don't want you to lose sight of that because I do believe there are darker days ahead of us. And we better know who we believe in. We better know who He is. We better know what He's capable of. Or else we may not make it through. But He is amazing. He is the way maker. When the enemy's coming in, it's in your new place to go. Just keep on moving forward in faith. And He will make a way where there seems to be no way. That's what he did for Israel. Well, you know what? He will do it for you. Amen. So stand with me this morning. Let's end our time together singing the song, Waymaker. And let's just begin to praise and exalt his name. And again, if you need to seek the Lord of it, live it today, fine. If you need to lay some things down, that's fine. But if you just need to let go and give God uh, just truly a, a, a heartfelt and soul pouring out worship today, that's what I want you to do as we close. Last week, I, I was going to say this towards the end of last week. When we were singing a song in the service last week, at one point I literally felt like God was going to come out of my skin. I wanted to just so much just, it took everything within me just to contain myself and, and, and who I, and who, me being me. Because God is awesome. He is awesome. He is awesome. He is awesome. Amen.